As Hilda was saying, I'm um, uh, Karina Gray and I'm a public health doctor, so I'm coming from a slightly different perspective, um, I'm coming from a population health perspective, and I've been asked to talk about cardiovascular disease. Um, so, so, so these are some of the things I'm going to cover in the next half hour or so. I'll give a little bit of context and talk about Pacific peoples in New Zealand. I'm sure a lot of you will know this already. I'll then talk about the life expectancy gap and recent trends in cardiovascular disease and then talk about some of the factors that could be contributing to the trends that we see. I'll talk about some possible strategies to address the equity gap, and then I'd really like to get your thoughts and ideas about cardiovascular priorities for Pacific peoples, because I know there's a lot of expertise in this room and I really want to capture it while I'm here. Um, so before I get into all of that, um, I guess I'd like to share with you why Pacific health is so important to me. Um, this is a picture of my family, so my mum, my dad, my brother and my sister. Um, I was born in Samoa, um, my mum's Samoan and my dad's New Zealand European, and we moved to New Zealand when I was five. And the primary reason we moved here was because my brother has um, a few disabilities and chronic health conditions, including what is still very treatment resistant epilepsy. And so we moved to New Zealand in order to access better quality care for my brother, including some surgeries and some um, physical therapy. And so from an early age, I was really kind of hyper aware of how life changing being able to access good quality care is. And so the primary reason I went into medicine was to help not only my family, but families like mine um, access good quality health care. Um, and I'd also like to, um, I guess before I start, acknowledge um, Pacific Perspectives, um, Dr. <coughs> Debbie Ryan and Brendan Mastruski. Um, recently we published um, this um, paper called Tofa Saili, a review of evidence about Pacific health equity, um, and that was designed to feed into the um, health and disability system review that Heather Simpson is uh, currently undergoing. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that you see in this talk is from, from this. And I'd encourage you guys, if you are interested in more detail about Pacific health equity, that this publication is available on the Health and Disability System Reviews website under the appendices. So, um, I mean, we've got lots of Pacific people in the room and people who work with Pacific people. Um, we all know that Pacific is not an ethnic group. You know, people talk about being Samoan or Tongan. Um, it's really just an umbrella term to describe a population of people made up of a number of distinct <coughs> ethnic groups, languages and cultures. So, as Hilda was saying, the five largest groups in New Zealand are Samoans, who make up about half of Pacific peoples in New Zealand, followed by Cook Island, Māori and Tongan, who each make up about 20% of people, um, and then Nuan and Fijian. But despite this being an umbrella term, there are some commonly shared values um, amongst Pacific peoples that have been well articulated by the Ministry of Pacific Peoples. <coughs> and these include the central place of family, collectivism and communitarianism, so everyone working together <coughs> towards a common good, the importance of spirituality, you know, attributing life events to a higher power, <coughs> reciprocity, that mutual help and interdependence, and respect, particularly for our elders and for people in positions of authority. So um, we've just got the results, just some high level results from the 2018 census. Um, and there are about 382,000 pe Pacific peoples living in New Zealand. So they make up about 8% of the New Zealand population. And that's up from a uh, little less than 300,000 at the 2013 <coughs> census. We haven't got the um, kind of a lot of detail from the 2018 census. So a lot of the results that I'll be talking about today are still from the 2013 census. Um, we're a very young and youthful population, so a third of Pacific peoples are aged under 15, uh, compared to 18% of non-Pacific people, and only 5% are aged um, over 65. And we're also very diverse, so one in four Pacific peoples are like me, they identify with more than one ethnic group, um, and that diversity is increasing, so 40% of Pacific children aged under five identify with more than one ethnic group. Um, and Despite this kind of um, perception of uh, Pacific peoples being a migrant population, 
In fact, the majority, uh, about 60%, are now born in New Zealand. And even among, among those who haven't been born in New Zealand, 60% have spent more than 10 years in New Zealand. Um, so one of, the th one of the really important things when we're thinking about um, planning for health services are looking at where Pacific <coughs> peoples are based. And like Asian people in New Zealand, we're very, we're very much an urbanised um, population. And this table here shows um, the number of Pacific people is at the 2013 census. Um, in the seven largest DH, uh, the seven DHBs with the largest Pacific populations. So about 85% of Pacific peoples um, reside in these seven DHBs. Um, so in counties Manukau and Auckland DHBs, um, we've got quite a high um, percentage of Pacific people. So more than one in five people living in counties identify as Pacific, and more than one, one in 10 uh, people living in Auckland identify as Pacific. <coughs> also, two thirds of New Zealand's Pacific population resides in the three Auckland DHBs. So Auckland is a really important place when we're thinking about Pacific people. But even within DHBs, we find that um, Pacific peoples are concentrated in specific localities. So this table here shows four localities in counties Manukau, um, the number of Pacific people, the share of the total New Zealand population, and the percent of that locality that is Pacific. So as you can see in Mangere Otara, six in 10, 60% of the population living in that locality is actually Pacific. Um, and uh, Twenty percent of New Zealand's Pacific population resides in that locality, um, and then in Monaco, there's uh, one in f one in four uh, people living in that locality is Pacific, and so that's really important to know um, because when we're thinking about targeting of health services um, and um, where people are concentrated, um, that's really useful. We also know that Pacific peoples face some challenging socio-economic. Um, circumstances. So this table here is, um, shows how Pacific people compare with the total population when we're looking at specific um, socioeconomic factors. So um, compared to the total population, Pacific people have higher rates of unemployment, are far less likely to live in areas of high deprivation, um, lower weekly earnings, much lower rates of home ownership, and we know that they're declining as well. Um, and higher rates of overcrowding. Despite that, um, we also know that Pacific peoples report high levels of well-being and social connectedness, and this is really important when we're thinking about the strengths within our communities. So this data here in, in this table is from the um, New Zealand General Social Survey, which looks at well-being. Uh, oh, sorry. So as you can see, compared to New Zealand Europeans, Pacific people are just as likely to rate their overall life satisfaction as high and their life as worthwhile and um, feeling safe in their own neighbourhood. But also, compared to New Zealand Europeans, Pacific people um, are, are more likely to report face-to-face -face contact with friends or family in the last week. So there's that social connectedness and consequently, they're less likely to report feeling lonely. So just moving on to some of the health outcomes, I'm sure many of you have seen this graph before. Um, this graph shows uh, trends in life expectancy over the last 15 years. Um, and public health people love life expectancy because it's a really good summary measure of how well a population is doing. Because it's basically the average um, length of life a person born today is expected to live based on current um, mortality trends. Uh, so as you can see here, um, this is the um, trends in life expectancy for non-Māori and non-Pacific. This is for Pacific and this is for um, Māori people. So as you can see, over that time, there's remained this gap in life expectancy of about six or seven years. But the other thing to note, and I was just talking to Wing about this in the um, morning tree break, is that trends in life expectancy have been fairly flat for Pacific people. 
Um, so if you look at Māori, they've been increasing, which is great news, and it looks like the gap for Māori is actually um, reducing, but we don't see that reduction in the gap for Pacific peoples. Um, so earlier this year, there was a um, paper published in the New Zealand Medical Journal, which actually looked at the specific conditions which were contributing to the life expectancy gap for Māori and Pacific peoples. And these two graphs show the conditions contributing to the life expectancy gap for Pacific men and Pacific women. Uh, so for Pacific men, the top three conditions were coronary heart disease, diabetes, and um, <coughs> lung cancer. And for Pacific women, it was diabetes, coronary disease, and stroke. So this table shows um, a similar sort of thing, but grouping all the cardiovascular diseases together. So this table shows the years contributing to the life expectancy gap for these specific conditions. So as you can see, cardiovascular disease um, contributes almost two years to the life expectancy gap for Pacific men um, and over a year for Pacific <coughs> women. Diabetes is also a big one. And we kind of sort of think of cardiovascular disease and diabetes together. So together, um, these conditions contribute about two and a half years to the life expectancy gap for Pacific men and two years to the gap for women. Um, and cancer is also a big one. But today I'll, co I'll concentrate on cardiovascular disease. So the next few graphs is um, from some research that we did at the University of Auckland, which were looking at trends in coronary disease deaths and hospitalisations um, between 2006 and 2015. Um, so on the left we've got um, coronary disease deaths for men um, and on the right we've got women. So red shows the trends for Māori, Pacific are in blue, Indian are in green, um, Europeans in black and then Asian, um, non-Indian Asians in purple. So as you can see from this graph there remains this huge gap um, with uh, Māori and Pacific men and women having much higher rates of cardiovascular disease deaths. Um, and then we also calculated the average rate of decline over this time. So for most groups, the average rate of decline was between 4 and 5% per year. Um, for Pacific men, it was a little bit lower, about 3%. But for Pacific women, it was much lower, about 1% per year. So then we, so we've looked at the deaths, so this shows deaths on the, on the right, and we also looked at trends in coronary disease hospitalisations. And this is what we found um, on the left. So despite Māori and Pacific people having the highest rate of coronary disease deaths, we found that it was actually Indian men that had the highest rates of hospitalisations. And we were quite surprised at this, so to look at this a bit further, we calculated a ratio of hospitalisations to deaths. And this equated to about how many men are hospitalised with coronary disease for every man that dies. So for Indian and Asian men, the ratio was about seven or eight. So about seven or eight men are hospitalised with coronary disease for every man that dies. For European men, that ratio is a bit lower, it's about five. But for Māori and Pacific men, that ratio was much lower, about three or four. Um, and then we find a similar thing for women. So that the ratio of deaths is about eight for Indian and Asian women, um, about six for uh, Europeans, and again quite low, um, under four for Māori and Pacific women. Um, so we're not really sure what this means. Um, obviously there's a whole bunch of factors that could be contributing to this, um, but clearly there's something to do with access to care, um, that Pacific, Māori and Pacific people um, are just not able to access care for coronary disease. And this is a, um, I've just kind of added this graph, we've got a student at the moment who's looking at um, trends in stroke um, over the same time period. So this is kind of hot off the press, she hasn't published this yet. Um, and this is stroke incidents, so um, people without a history of stroke who either die from stroke or are hospitalised with it. Um, and this is in the young people, under 65s. So as you can see, um, just, uh, here we've got European, Indian and Asian 
um, rates, and then again you've got this equity gap. So then we ask ourselves, what are the factors that could be contributing to this equity gap? And you know, we all know all about the socioeconomic determinants of health and how important they are. Um, but I'd also like to focus on the risk factors and comorbidities and access to and quality of care. So Brian did a great talk um, just before morning tea about diabetes, so I don't need to go over this um, in great detail. Um, but you know, there's this huge equity gap in diabetes um, for Pacific people. And you know, by the time we're, um, some, a Pacific person is age 65, over 60% of the population has diagnosed diabetes. So that's something we need to get our, um, our heads around. And Brian also talked about multimorbidity. So that's the presence of two or more chronic conditions in a single patient. And that's associated with um, poor physical functioning, mental health, quality of life, and there's a growing um, body of evidence around multimorbidity. Um, but also, our health system is, at the moment, very much based on a single disease equity. You come in um, and someone will treat you for pneumonia or cellulitis. Um, it's also associ associated with uh, polypharmacy. So there have been a few studies in New Zealand looking at multimorbidity, and there's um, increasing interest. Um, and estimates vary, but um, no matter what study you look at, Pacific peoples have the highest rates of multimorbidity. So a group down in Otago looked at um, multimorbidity using um, hospitalisations and um, pharmaceutical dispensing, and they estimated that about 14% of Pacific adults and 8% of Europeans had multimorbidity. Um, and there was a, a recent study in a Dunedin general practice which found that two, over, uh, almost two-thirds of Pacific people had multimorbidity and over half of Māori. So this graph is from um, the study from the University of, of Otago. I just took this off the internet. Um, and this basically shows the prevalence of multimorbidity based on hospital <coughs> discharge diagnoses. Um, so as you can see, and this is the age group along the um, x-axis. So as you can see, at each age group, um, Māori and Pacific people have far higher rates of multimorbidity compared to other groups. I didn't show, um, they also had prevalence of multimorbidity based on pharmaceutical dispensing. Um, but I'm not sure I, um, I think that information is useful because again we've got that, um, that access gap so um, Pacific people might be less likely to access pharmaceuticals. So there's lots of evidence that shows that um, Pacific people have high rates of unmet need for healthcare. Um, on, on the right here we've got um, a graph of ASH rates for zero to four year olds. Um, and whether you believe in ASH or not, ambulatory sensitive hospitalisations are all about hospitalisations that could potentially have been avoided um, with good quality um, primary care um, and looking at the social determinants. So for years and years, so this is 2006 to 2016, Pacific children have had ASH rates that are twice as high as the total New Zealand population. And when we use the comparison group, the total New Zealand population, it actually includes Pacific people. So the gap is actually larger than that. We also know that uh, the New Zealand Health Survey um, every year includes a few questions on unmet need for care. So I think the questions are, in the past 12 months, uh, were you unable to access primary care for whatever reason? Um, so we know that um, Pacific people um, have about the same rates of um, access to GP care as the total population, but they report higher rates of unmet need for care um, and higher rates due to cost. But I'm particularly interested in this one. So 18% of Pacific people reported that they had not filled a prescription in the last 12 months because of cost, compared to 7% of the total population. Um, so I recently completed my PhD, it took me a very long time, eight years, um, but it's not a race, it's not a race, um, on um, cardiovascular disease and access to care. And here are the, some of the things that um, I found. So compared to Europeans, Pacific and Māori people are 
50% more likely to die from coronary disease before reaching the hospital. They're 50% more, so once they reach the hospital, they're 50% more likely to die from coronary disease in the 28 days following hospitalisation. They're less likely to travel um, to hospital by ambulance when they're having a heart attack. And they're less likely to receive coronary revascularisation, so that's either stenting um, or uh, bypass surgery. And they're also less likely to be maintained on long-term medications after a heart attack. So we specifically looked at lipid-lowering therapy, um, but the same is true for um, other medications. And yes, these differences do remain significant even after we adjust for demographics and other factors such as comorbidities, hospital of admission um, and prior disease. And adjusting for hospital of, of admission is really important because because um, Pacific peoples are, um, tend to be concentrated in urban areas, um, we, we don't have rurality as a factor. So we can't say that Pacific peoples aren't able to access care because they're in the rural areas. Actually, they're in the, um, they're in the areas where they've got tertiary hospital facilities. Um, so now we ask ourselves, what can we do to achieve uh, equity in cardiovascular disease? Um, and we don't have the answers, but um, here are just some of my thoughts. So obviously, socioeconomic determinants are really important for Pacific people. So we really um, need to think about reducing socioeconomic inequities and mitigating against the effects of poverty. We also need to address cardiovascular risk factors in the obesogenic <coughs> environment, and that, and that includes um, looking at diabetes um, and doing some of the great stuff that um, Brian's doing. We need to improve access and quality of care right along the cardiovascular pathway, address the health literacy needs of our services and communities, increase the Pacific Health workforce, including pathways into leadership. Encourage regular monitoring and robust evaluation of services and programs by ethnicity. And we need to have strategies that are led by and take advantages of the strengths of our Pacific communities. So when we think about access and quality of care, we have to remember that um, access is a pathway right from um, preventive and primary care right through to secondary care. So in primary care, people get risk assessed they have their cardiovascular disease risk assessed and then they can um, get some advice on lifestyle um, changes and also medications which are, have been shown to significantly reduce their risk of having a heart attack. So that's the lifestyle advice and the pills. Opt optimising control of comorbidities including diabetes. And letting, um, letting people know about the um, the symptoms of a heart attack and what to do because what's, what's really important when you are having a heart attack is access to defibrillation and that means ringing an ambulance um, and for those of you who live in the Wellington region, congratulations you have a free ambulance but for the rest of the country um, it's $80 if someone calls an ambulance for you. Um, making sure that we have um, equitable access to interventions which have been shown to reduce um, your risk of another event after you've had a heart attack. Making sure that people have access to um, medications after their heart attack. And cardiac rehabilitation, which um, has, there's lots of evidence around cardiac rehabilitation, but the rates of completion are really low. So health literacy, people love to talk about health literacy. But we have to remember that health literacy is actually about the health system. Having a health system that, mean, um, that makes sure that people are able to understand information and um, take things away so that they're able to, um, to action that. So there's a lovely um, nurse um, down in um, Wellington, Dr Tuasuka, who completed her PhD looking at Samoan people's knowledge and experiences of cardiovascular disease and risk assessment. And it was amazing what she found. Um, people said to her, oh, my doctor came in and told me that I need to come in and have a heart check. But they didn't put me on a treadmill, they didn't do an ECG, they just took my blood pressure. So people didn't understand what the cardiovascular check was all about. 
and then they weren't able to action any lifestyle advice because they didn't find it relevant to them. So, you know, we have health targets in place that talk about um, completion of risk assessments, but actually that's meaningless if it doesn't translate into change for our people. The Ministry of Health also developed a really good framework for health literacy which is all about the health system reducing health literacy demands on people and building the health literacy um, capacity of the workforce. Um, and there have been numerous studies that have looked at uh, language and communication in primary care. Um, and even if people have really good um, English language ability, people again and again say, I'd really like to have the information in my own language because some of that medical terminology is really hard to understand. Um, and also people, people do say things like the medical jargon is often used as a way for the, medical, um, for the doctors to kind of put themselves at a distance from me. So encouraging the use of interpreters um, and asking people, you know, what do, what do you understand from, from what I've just said? Um, do you understand what you have to do now? Um, and because, because I'm a data person, we really need regular up-to-date monitoring and robust evaluation. We need to track trends for our different ethnic groups. We need to assess whether interventions are actually making a difference. And for those that are, we need to scale them up. And we also need to ensure that inequities are improving and not getting worse. Let's keep an eye on that life expectancy gap and make sure that it's uh, starting to improve. Um, and finally, we need to make sure that everything we do takes a strengths-based approach because there are so many strengths within our Pacific communities. We have to take advantage of that high level of social connectedness, of the high levels of church involvement and of volunteering within our Pacific communities. Um, and over here, I'm not sure uh, if you guys were aware, but um, a couple of months ago, people from the Growing Up in New Zealand study published this study which looked at telomere length. Does anyone know what telomeres are? Yeah, so they're these little bits on chromosomes um, which people think um, is related to the length of your lifespan. So basically the longer your telomere length, the longer your, li your potential lifespan. Um, and in the four-year-old children, guess who had the longest telomeres? Yeah, it was Pacific kids. It was great. But so, so we've got the potential, but let's all get together and make sure that our kids are able to realise that potential. Um, and um, earlier, uh, well, a couple of months ago as well, um, the Heart Foundation and the um, Health, okay. Healthier Lives put together um, a grant um, for $2 million to specifically look at heart, heart health inequities for Māori and Pacific people. Um, and I've been lucky enough to be awarded that grant, so it's $2 million over three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, and I'm co-leading that with Dr. Um, Associate Professor Matari Howard. Um, and we're going to be looking at quantitative and qualitative analyses focused on um, access to care.